Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Miss Wright and I am continuing today um, our read aloud for the story packs. Um, when we last left off, um, some sad things had happened. Um, Pax um, had, was staying with uh, Runt and with Bristol um, by the river and the old mill uh, because Runt had been injured by a mine. And so Pax was staying there with him and helping protect him. And uh, that's what happened to him when we left off. Chapter 23. The moon shone through the trees as full and creamy yellow as the eggs Pax had eaten a week before. His stomach cramped as he paced the river's edge. Only three times in a week and a half since his humans had left him had he eaten a meal big enough to fill his belly, and the last one, a pile of fish rotting on the bank, he'd retched up minutes later. He had received the cached ham and watched with pride as Bristle and Runt ate the meat, but he hadn't touched any of it, and he still had no luck hunting. All of his fat reserves were gone. His coat hung loose and he was burning muscle. Pax trained his nose to the human's camp, which, as always, tortured him with its rich food scents. Over the past two days, where more, more war sick had arrived and hundreds of them were massing to the south beyond, the ground vibrated with their threat. But Pax was hungry. He looked over to where Bristle was guarding the sleeping runt and signaled that he would leave. Although he could see the camp directly above him, he chose his old route up the gouge and across the river, across the ridge, because the guards on the wall were facing the river. He padded up the rocks in the water, leaving no tracks. Away from the silence of the devastated field, his ears now pricked towards night sounds. He knew them now. They comforted him. The thin piping of bats, the careless crashing of a swaddling skunk, and the underground bustle of the voles, the distant calls of owls, all these sounds told him he was not hunting alone. Pax himself made no noise. He had learned the secrets of stealth from Gray and Bristle. Like the shadow, he slipped across the ridge, down the hill, and into the grub net tent. No easy meat hung this night, but the tables were piled high with vegetables and breads. He knocked a wheel of cheese to the ground. The taste was strong and strange, but he gulped until his belly stretched tight. As he headed back out, carrying a hunk for bristle, a familiar scent stopped him in his tracks. Peanut butter. It was drifting out of the large metal can. Pax dropped the cheese. He stood to sniff at the rim. Like the garbage bin at his boy's home, the can promised a variety of scraps. But above the co-mingled scents rose the one he craved more than any other. His whiskers ruffled in pleasure. He nudged the lid aside a few inches. The clear jar lay on the top of the heap its sides smeared thick with the creamy prize. Pax edged his snout under the lid and bit the top of the rim carefully. He knew from experience that this was how to grip the jar so it didn't cover his nose. He pushed away from the garbage can, and the lid clattered to the stony ground, ringing an alarm in the quiet night. Pax ducked under the table and froze. His pulse quickened. Across the tent, the flap snapped open. A human stepped in and clicked on a beam of light. Even over the peanut butter, Pax recognized the scent. The boy's father. Pax raised a paw, ready to dart in whatever direction seemed safest. The man swept the light around the tent. When it fell on Pax's eyes, he winced but didn't move.
His pupils adjusted, and Pax saw the man crouch to stare at him. Pax remained frozen, paw still raised, jar still clamped in his jaws, studying the man's face as the man studied his. The man grunted, rubbing his chin. Then he gave a rough laugh. Pax lowered his paw an inch, holding the man's gaze, testing him. His boy's father laughed again, then rose and lifted the tent flap. He kicked his boot through the opening. Pax knew the, single, the signal. The man had used it on him often at the door of the human's house, at the door of his pen. Go through, it meant. Go through right now, and I won't harm you. The pact was reliable. Pax sped past him into the safety of the night. He didn't slow down until he reached the, hill, the spine of the hill. He buried the jar and then crouched to watch for the movement at camp in the pre-dawn light. Although he was certain no humans had followed him, he took off east, snaking a loose loop for a half an hour before doubling back to drop down to the river. Runt was awake when Pax returned, and for the first time since the explosion, he was struggling to rise. Bristle urged him back down. But Pax saw that his lips were cracked and his eyes sunken. He needs water. Bristle looked to the river's edge. A dozen full bounds for a healthy fox. Would that even be possible for Runt? A little, the little fox braced his forelegs. He tightened his haunches to rise, then looked back in surprise. The leg had been part of him his whole life. As much a part of him as his own scent was gone. He bent and sniffed at the wound. He looked up at Pax and then Bristle, as if searching for an explanation. Again he strained upward. His one remaining back leg jacked him up and Runt rolled onto his wounded haunch, haunch, haunch with a yelp of pain. Pax leaped to stand by his injured side. Runt got to his front legs once more and then straightened his one back leg. Again, he canted over. This time, though, he fell against the strong flank of the older fox, and he did not cry out. He wobbled, searching for new balance. When he found it, Pax took a single step toward the water, then waited. Runt stepped out. First, the two front legs, then a dragging hop with the single back leg, and collapse against Pax. Again, Pax took a single step. Again, the small fox matched it, and again, and once more, until he didn't waver at all. Bristle ran ahead to the bank, and step by wounded step, Runt closed the distance until he flopped down by the river bank and stretched his neck out to lap at the cool water. When he was sated, he dropped his head, eyes closing. But Bristle nipped him. Soon it would be full daylight. He would be exposed. She ran upriver to stand of cattails. Runt limped after her. He was still clumsy and trembling and slow, but he did not fall once. Pax followed close by. Just as they reached the stand of reeds, Pax startled at the crackling of brush from downstream. Bristle's head snapped around too, ears cocked to the same spot across the river. Something large was coming. Runt dipped his head to sniff at a snail. Pax and Bristle backed into the cattail reeds. Bristle called to her brother. Runt did not turn his head. A buck pranced out of the vegetation, tossed its antlers, and then splashed into the river. Bristle barked for her brother again and again he ignored her. The deer clattered up onto the other bank, heading for the bright grass of an unscorched area of field. At its edge, he lifted a hoof. As he set it down, the earth rocked and the bright grass blew. The buck burst up, his back twisting and snapping. Runt screamed in his terror at the quaking ground. Bristle and Pax herded him into the cool dark of the reeds, and soothed him until he understood he was unharmed. The foxes watched the soldiers run down the hill, sweep their beams of light over the heap in the field, then go back. As the pink sun rose over the pines, 
Vast patches of grass in the field flared up and crackled. Field mice stumbled out toward the cool safety of the river bank. Dazed and disoriented, they would have made easy meals, but Bristle let them pass, as if obeying some code to protect those so terrified. She stood and gazed over the smoking field. We have to leave here, now. Pax knew she was right. He followed her out of the reeds. Bristle called to Runt, who was watching a wandering bull. He didn't even flick his ears toward his sister. And Pax understood. He can't hear. Chapter 24 When Peter came into the kitchen, he found Vola always already drinking coffee. She couldn't have slept any more than he had. He'd heard her leave for the barn in the middle of the night, and she hadn't come back until nearly dawn. She raised her mug. Breakfast before you go? He shook his head. Vola nodded and took his pack from him. She stuffed a brown paper bag into it. Eat the ham sandwiches first. Ham won't keep. And there's a jar of salve. Put it on twice a day. I filled your thermos, but you'll have to be on the lookout for springs. Keep that cast dry, though. I mean it. Tape a garbage bag around it if it rains. She sat the pack, do the pack down, and Peter noticed she had two shoes on. Hey, you're wearing it. She lifted her overall cuff. Condition number one. Wow, Peter managed after a minute. Holy Dable man. Where's the old one? Vola tipped her head to the armchair. I don't know what to do with it. Maybe put it on the scarecrow? Not on the scarecrow, Peter answered, instantly sure. He pointed to the fireplace. The phoenix, remember? All his stuff burns in the nest. Vola sighed, but she followed him. Peter stirred the embers and added some kindling. Vola brought the wooden post over. It looked smaller somehow. The leather straps reminded Peter of the ones binding the marionette's feet and hands. You okay? I'm okay. Vola placed the wooden leg onto the flames, and both of them watched until it caught. Vola walked away first. Peter noticed how smooth her gait was with the prosthesis. You wouldn't even guess. He pulled the screen over the fire. When she got home today, there'd be nothing but a pile of ashes. You okay with the other two conditions? He asked, trailing her to the kitchen. We'll find out at the library, but I loaded the tractor already. The tractor? How else are we going to cart 20 marionettes into town? We're driving to the library on a tractor? We're driving to the library on a tractor, unless you've got a magic carpet you haven't told me about and we have to leave soon to make that bus, so you're ready? Yeah, I've got everything I need. Well, not quite you don't. She reached down beside the, behind the door and drew out something that surprised Peter so much he couldn't respond. You know what it is, right? The baseball bat was turned perfectly smooth, the weight so solid and balanced that the world seemed to slow as he hefted it. You made this. But I don't need... I think you do. Maybe when you get where you're going, you'll figure out why. Peter ached to hand the bat back, but Vola had stayed up last night carving it for him, and she looked so proud. Maybe it was time to own one again. He balanced on his crutches and took a slow motion swing, and the other bad memory swept him. His seven-year-old fury a wildness he couldn't control, the exhilarating fright of that wildness. His mother's blue gazing globe batted off its pedestal into a million shards, her tears. You've got to tame that temper. Don't be like him. Her bloodied fingers picking the blue glass daggers from her white roses, his shame as he watched her drive away. He slid the bat into his back, in his pack, where it fit as though it has always been there, treacherous. He hoisted the pack. 
Underneath was the newspaper clipping. He picked it up, and his eye caught the date. He crumpled it to the chair, got kicked. He crumpled to the chair, got kicked. What? He knew. Peter shoved the clippings across the table. He knew. This is 12 days old. So my father knew this when we left Pax. It hurt to take a breath, like knives to his lungs. When I asked to leave Pax on that old mill road because it would be safe, he knew. Peter's hands burned. He looked down. They were balled into tight fists. He forced them open. How could he have done that? Vola came over, eyeing him carefully. I'm sorry. That's a very bad thing. His jaw clenched. Could teeth shatter? He forced it open. How could anyone have done that? I know you're angry. Peter's fist had balled up again, the nails gouging his sore palms. He jammed them between his knees. No, I told you. I don't get angry. I'm not like him. I won't be like him. Vola sat down across from him. Oh, I see. I see now. But I don't think that's going to work out. You're human, and humans feel anger. Not me. Too dangerous. Vola threw back her head and barked her startling laugh. Oh, let me tell you, feelings are all dangerous. Love, hope, ha! Hope? You talk about dangerous, eh? No, you can't avoid any of them. We all own a beast called anger. It can serve us. Many good things come of anger at bad things. Many unjust things are made just. But first, we all have to figure out how to civilize it. Peter felt his wiring begin to snap. Just one time. Could you not tell me I have to figure something out? Just once. Would it kill you to help? Come on, I'm leaving. You've got all this... He waved his hands up to the bulletin board. Wisdom, would it kill you to send me off with some advice? What, you want me to give you a philosophy bingo card for your trip? Like, when you smell honey in the woods, run because the bear can't be far behind? Yeah, I guess, but for real. Well, for real, I don't have any magic truth to guide you. It's your trip, not mine. But now that you bring it up, I do have a card for you. She pulled off one off the board and handed it over. It's blank. It is now. But a trip like this, you'll find something to fill it with. A truth of your own that you discover on your own. At that, Peter suddenly felt exhausted, as if he'd been holding himself rigid for years. He had been on his own for so long. Vola studied him. Oneness is always growing in the world, boy. Two, but not two. It's always there, connecting its roots, humming. I can't be part of it. That's the price I pay for taking myself away. But you can be. You can vibrate with its heartbeat. You may be on your own, but you won't be alone. What if I get lost? You will not get lost. I think maybe I already am. Vola reached across the table, cupped his head, and pressed. No, you are found. She got up, and Peter felt her brush a kiss on his hair as she passed. The tractor wasn't actually that uncomfortable, but it was slow and bumpy and loud, too loud for them to talk easily, even though Peter was sitting right next to Vola. That was okay with him. He had a lot to think about. Even after they had turned onto the smoother highway shoulder, Vola was quiet, and Peter figured she had some things on her mind, too. But when she pointed at a hawk wheeling overhead, he remembered something he'd always wanted to ask. What's it with you and birds? The feathers. Vola patted the feathers on her rawhide necklace and smiled. T. Pool. When I was born, I reminded my parents of a bird. My hair stuck up like feathers, and I had a scrawny neck, and I squawked for food all the time. I'm part Creole, part Italian, 
and part a dozen other things. But all people who revered birds and their cultures, my parents realized, so they named me Vola. It means fly in Italian. But they named me T. Pool, little chicken. My chickens grace me with feathers, and I wear them to remember that when I was born, someone saw me as a bird. That's all, not much of a story. But it was a good story, Peter thought, and it explained the look she always got on her face when she lifted the rock. It would be the hardest for her to give away. He looked behind them at the four crude pine crates and the marionettes were packed in, strapped to the back. Peter hoped they didn't remind Vola of coffins. Her amazing puppets were going to live now, really live out in the real world, not just to exist, not just to exist to perform some kind of penance. And maybe Vola would too, and maybe that was too much to ask. He was still wondering about that when the tractor sputtered to a stop in the library parking lot, hunkering over three spaces. Vola climbed down and hoisted one of the boxes. Peter followed her, but at the brick wide steps, he stopped and tapped Vola's shoulder. You know, he whispered, you have to be a little careful in there. Careful? About language, you know? Vola looked at him blankly. He was going to have to spell it out for her. This isn't the kind of place where people say dablement a lot. Oh, please. I think I know that boy. Her tone was withering, but it held the hint of a grin. Peter opened the door and swept her through. The librarian looked like a tossed handful of jewels, bright coral scarf, gold silk blouse, sapphire blue skirt. She smiled as Vola came in and set her crate on the table, and when the top lifted, her mouth fell into a perfect O. Peter remembered he'd been speechless too the first time he'd seen those puppets. He backed out the door to give Vola some privacy. The morning's clouds lifted, and the sky was so bright that it hurt his eyes. The sound seemed brighter than usual, too. Or maybe it was just because things had been so quiet this past week. A barking dog, two women chatting, brake, bike brake squealing, children shrieking in a playground beside the parking lot. He had missed these sounds. He had missed the world. He wondered if Vola missed it all the time. He headed over to watch the little kids playing for a few minutes. Most of them were tearing around, jumping onto and off benches and slapping the swings in some kind of made-up game. A frowning girl with a straw-colored ponytail was digging by herself in a sandbox, earnestly shoving shovelful after shovelful from one pile to another. Sitting on the sandbox, looking bored, when his head popped propped in a baseball glove was a boy in a faded red t-shirt. The shortstop from the ball practice. Peter moved closer. Hey. The boy looked up then stood as if readying for a fight. He nodded at Peter's crutches. I wondered why you didn't show. How did you do? The shortstop scoffed. Like you don't know you creamed us. He took the little girl's shovel and handed her a pink sweatshirt. Come on, let's go home. Wait! Peter felt a crazy, rising panic. Maybe being a hermit for a week had made him weird already. But the boy was lifting his sister out of the sandbox, and they were going to leave, and he couldn't let that happen yet. Wait! You know when you're on the field, and you know what you're supposed to do, and you're ready? When the game's about to start and the glove turns into part of your hand, and you know exactly where, you're spo where you should be? That feeling. Do you think that's peace? The boy scowled at Peter. He shook his head as if he wanted to shake off the whole encounter, and then starting walk started walking away, pulling his sister by the hand. Peter could only watch as they left the playground, feeling that something valuable had just slipped away. <coughs> Excuse me. At the gate, though, the shortstop turned. He was pretty far away, but it looked like maybe he wasn't frowning anymore. He lifted a hand and shot two fingers up in a peace sign. Peter lifted his own two fingers back. 
Inside, the librarian was unpacking the last crate. Half a dozen kids had materialized, and they gaped and grinned as she lifted out each marionette. Vola stood off to the side, watching. She turned to leave when she caught sight of Peter. Peter stabbed out a crutch to block her. Condition three? Condition number three? He asked with a glance back to the librarian. Vola gave him a look that was half irritation, half grudging defeat. She turned back to the librarian. I forgot to say, B, that I'll come back once a week to teach the kids how to use them. B. Booker smiled, a slow smile that reminded Peter of melted caramel. That'd be awfully nice. Vola set out for the door, but Peter blocked her path again. Vola threw her palms up. What now? He raised two fingers. What? Oh, for... Fine. She walked back to the table. B. Twice a week. I'll come twice a week to teach the kids. The librarian broke out into a wide grin. The children would love that. Be good to see you more too, Vola. Maybe we could go for that coffee afterward. A little girl with a fountain of beaded pigtails tugged on Vola's overalls. She pointed to the elephant. How do you make him dance? She demanded. Peter held his breath, but instead of lecturing the girl about figuring out things for herself, Vola crouched down to study the elephant. Peter noticed that the movement was smoother with the prosthesis. She had an ankle joint now. Such a simple thing, being able to flex. How much she'd given up. What makes you think he wants to dance? Vola asked. Red toenails, like mine. The little girl wiggled her toes in her sandals. Then her hand drifted up to stroke the feathers at Vola's neck. Vola startled at the touch, and Peter held his own breath again but she only reached out and patted the girl's own necklace of yellow pop beads. Then she pointed to the clock over the desk, which read almost 11. I've got something important to do right now, but I'll be back in a half hour. If you're still here, we'll figure out how to make him dance. By the time they grabbed Peter's pack and crossed the street, the bus was already idling at the station. While Vola went to the ticket counter, Peter made his way to the group waiting to board. A shiver of current scurried up his spine. It was the same thrill that juiced him every time the umpire called play ball. Vola handed Peter the ticket. Lying in his hand, it looked too small for the power it contained. I'm going to get there, and I'm going to find him. Thank you. The bus door cranked open, and Vola leaned in. She pointed a warning finger at the driver. Robert, this boy is family. He's been visiting, and now he's going home. You see that he gets there safe and sound. She stepped away, and an elderly couple began their shaky climb abroad, aboard. Peter shifted his backpack and crutches. He took a step towards the bus. Then he turned back. I'm family? That's a truth, a thing as I've ever known. Now get on the bus. The steps were tall, but Peter hoisted himself with ease. He took a seat up front and gave Vola a thumbs up through the grimy glass. He was strong now. He was prepared. But when the air brakes hissed their release, he gripped the armrest. It was going to hurt a lot to watch her getting smaller and smaller. Vola motioned for him to slide the window open when the bus growled into gear. Boy, she called up as it lurched away from the curb. I'm going to leave the porch door open. Chapter 25 Pax dug. Since moving Runt up the gorge, Pax and Bristle had taken turns guarding him, a pact of protection. They would be his strong hind legs. They would be his ears. Runt was safe and sleeping inside the abandoned groundhog's den that Bristle had enlarged for him. Still, Pax felt anxious. Something was coming. He dug as he kept watch in the front of the burrow. The pads of his paws were toughened. They did not bleed. 
When Bristle returned from hunting, she dropped a chickmunk in front of him. Pax turned away, although he had not eaten since the cheese two nights before. He would not take food from Bristle or Runt. Bristle buried the chipmunk and then stretched out beside the den for her watch. Pax left to pace the perimeter of the clearing again. The location was good. Although it was near the encampment, it was high enough to feel safe from the exploding earth down near the river. Juniper bushes ringing the clearing would provide cover. More important, they would help disguise the fox's sense. A short distance away, a clear spring trickled from the cleft rock and grass was full of game. But something was wrong. Something was coming. Bax bounded the short distance through the trees to the ridge line above the encampment. The counter with the boy's father had left him too wary to attempt another raid, but at the same time he seemed more drawn to the camp. The man's motion, that sweeping of the kicked boot through the doorway and its conflicting message of goodwill and a threat, had reminded him that he needed to protect his boy. If the man lived at the camp, surely Peter would find his way there soon. It was mid-afternoon. Pax watched the war sick spread out along the river bank, rolling more wires, digging more holes, burying more dark boxes under the hot sun. The odor of their sweat spiked with new aggression. The danger he sensed was more than that, though. It was more primitive. He ran back and paced the clearing again. When he saw Runt emerge blinking from the den, Pax hurried over to examine him. No blood seeped from the wound, and it smelled clean. Runt ignored the meal Bristle dug out for him. Pax could see he was thirsty. I will take him to the spring. Bristle began to follow, but then she sat down and merely watched intently as they left. When they returned, Runt tumbled back into the den. Pax settled himself in front of it. The guard dog's burrow entrance felt too large. Groundhog the groundhog's burrow entrance felt too large, too open, and he felt better when he kept watch there. But Bristle called. Come with me. Watch. She picked her way into the grass, paw over silent paw, head low and cocked to the ground. Pax followed as carefully. In the middle of the clearing, she stopped short, ears perked forward, and shot a quick glance behind him. Pax heard it. A light, scur scuttering, a light scurrying under the netting of the dried grass that matted the ground. Bristle tracked it as she could see its movement. Then she sprang into the air and jacked straight down, paws over its nose, and emerged with a mouse in her jaws. She ate it in a few bites and then angled back across the clearing, searching again. She dropped to her haunches and cocked her ear to the left. Now you. Pax listened until he was sure he had located a tunneling rustle. A high leap. Then, then he tucked his paws over his nose to dive just as Bristle had. He landed hard. No mouse. He turned away from Bristle to huff out the dirt. Bristle stalked off. Pax followed, his head hanging, until she perked her ears toward another faint scurrying. Again, she backed away while Pax tried to pounce. Again, no mouse. Bristle studied Pax as he pawed the dirt from his cheeks. Follow me. Pax padded behind her until she stopped abruptly and dropped to a crouch. Before them was a hole in the thatch. It was warm in the fresh spent scent of many mice. Bristle warned him to stay back. Don't move. Watch. Bristle crept forward. In front of the hole, she dropped and laid her head on her paws. She closed her eyes to slits, and her whole body relaxed, as if in deep sleep. Pax was surprised. He had thought she was teaching him to hunt. He stood. Bristle tapped a warning with her singed tail. Stay. Pax settled again. For many moments, nothing happened. Then Pax caught the faintest stirring at the opening of the warren. A quivering nose tested the air and then retreated. Another long moment and the mouse reappeared. Its movements were so light, so alert, that Pax knew it was a whisker away from flight. Bristle didn't stir, except for the flicker of an eyelid. 
and she cut a warning glance to Pex. The mouse emerged and retreated twice more. Then, assured that the fox was asleep, it made a run for cover. Bristle's swift paw swept out and raked the doomed mouse to her jaws. Pax understood. Bristle retreated to guard Runt, and Pax trotted into the clearing, eager to find the telltale hole that would allow him to try the move himself. He found one beside a rotting log and drew in the scents of the colony of field mice. He settled himself a four legs reach away. His excitement made it hard to stay perfectly still, but at last a mouse came to the entrance and tested the air. Like Bristle's quarry, the mouse darted back in at the sight of the fox. Like Bristle's quarry, it reemerged until it was convinced Pax was asleep and made a run for it. Pax wasn't as quick as Bristle, but he managed to knock the mouse over, and as it scrambled to its feet, he swiped again and caught his first prey. It was a small meal, but each bite sent a hot current through Pax's body. The mouse's life now merged with his own. His muscles brimmed with energy. He sprang up and tore a, tore a joyful path around the clearing, running by Bristle in a blaze of red fur. She got to her feet to watch. Pax sped by again, scarcely skimming the ground, but it wasn't celebration enough. In the center of the clearing stood an old, crooked, sweet gum tree. Its lowest limbs reached out over the hollow. Its upper branches glinted blue with feeding jays. Pax flew at the trunk. He scrambled easily onto the first low branch and balanced there. Then step by cautious step, he began to walk across its length. Leaves rustled around him in welcome like green, fragrant green stars. Through them, he looked down in astonishment. The world had changed. From this vantage point, he could see through the ridgeline trees to the encampment and the river in the distance. The meadow grasses, which had just a moment ago had brushed his shoulders, now seemed flattened into a green bowl. Jays flew down to scold him. Pax recalled Runt's flight. He coiled himself, then sprang, stretching out and out and feeling the air ruffle his belly fur. He landed and threw his head back and barked his happiness. This new world was his. He could travel through it. He could feed himself on its bounty whenever he wanted. He was a part of it free, but not alone. Pax hurried to where he buried the peanut butter jar and unearthed it. He carried it back and dropped it in front of Bristle and Runt, who were drowsing in the burrow entrance in the last rays of the afternoon sun. Both of them came alive instantly at the strange scent. Bristle was on her feet first. She nudged the jar and jumped back at its surprising roll. She sniffed it all around and tested it with her tongue. One taste was all it took. Bristle locked the jar between her paws and began lapping greedily, cleaning out the top half in seconds. She stuck, she squirmed her snout in deeper. Pax had done the same thing. Be careful, you can get trapped. Too late. Bristle jumped up. She thrashed her head from side to side, but the jar was wedged on tightly. She hopped onto her hind paws, trying both forepaws to claw it off, tumbled over and over. Runt watched in amazement. His sister had never lost her composure before. Patch appro Pax approached, offering to help, but Bristle dashed away. She would do this herself. Finally, she rolled onto her back and pried the jar off her face with her hind legs. She shook herself and stalked back, her head and tail high. She dropped down beside Pax and began cleaning herself. Bristle had never sat this close to him before, with her flank pressed comfortably against his own. Her scent had never been this friendly. A streak of brown on Bristle's white cheek caught his attention. Without thinking of the consequences, he stretched out and licked it off, and Bristle allowed it. Pax cleaned her ears and her throat and muscle, and after a moment, Bristle returned the care. Cheek to cheek, the two foxes groomed each other. Bristle stopped to sniff Pax deeply. You don't smell of humans now. Pax didn't respond. He got to his feet to test the air. 
Something dangerous had entered the clearing at dusk, an animal scent he didn't recognize but feared. It was gone as quickly as it appeared, but Pax howled for Runt. Get inside the den, now. Chapter 26 Kid! Peter twisted around so sharply he nearly fell over. He'd certain the guard station was empty. He'd watched for ten minutes, ten full minutes to make sure before leaving his cover. A soldier came out from behind a truck. He lifted his rifle butt to the sign chained over the barricade. No entry. Peter straightened up as tall as he could on his crutches. It had been two days since he'd spoken to anyone. Two days since the bus driver had said, I don't know what you're really up to, son, but I doubt it's a good idea. If you want, I can get you on a bus back tonight. No shame in that. And Peter had replied, no thanks, because there would have been shame in turning back. And then the bus driver had said, all right then, good luck, and let him out. Not a soul had spoken to him that night. The town was on the perimeter of the evacuated area, and a few of the people he passed cast their eyes down, picked up speed, as if they couldn't afford to make contact with anyone who might need help. Nothing extra here, their look said. All is already lost. The next day, from sunrise to well past sunset, and most of this morning, he had traveled on roads through vacant towns, past abandoned schools and playgrounds and neighborhoods spookily silent without their squeaking tricycles, their car radios, their pickup ball games. The only sound had been water running through garden hoses when he'd filled his thermos. He hadn't seen any other humans, but he'd seen animals they'd left behind. A skittish pony tugging up the grass in front of a church, dogs eyeing him bayfully from behind dumpsters, dozens of skinny cats sliding away, their flanks as hollow as spoons. Hey, kid! The soldier moved closer. He eyed Peter's handmade crutches the tough cast, the dirty clothes. We evacuated this area almost two weeks ago. Where have you been? Don't you know that? I know that, but I left someone down there. I'm going to get him. Take it easy. We've checked the records. Everyone's out. He's not a person. Peter jutted out his chin, defying the soldier to argue that this mattered. Instead, the soldier's face changed, became somehow younger and Peter saw that he wasn't that long out of high school. He slid his rifle back into his sling. I have a dog, Henry. He didn't say anything else for a minute, just looked down the road as if he were hoping this dog of his would suddenly appear. Then he turned back and sighed. I don't think anyone's walking him. My sister said she'd do it, but she works. Want to see his picture? Even before Peter nodded, the soldier had drawn out his wallet. He held out a picture. A beagle. An ordinary beagle. Peter's throat hurt. The corners of the photo were warm and colorless. That picture had been taken out a lot. That's Henry. I got him for my eighth birthday. His hips are bad now, but he still likes his walk, you know? Still likes to sniff out squirrels and stuff. I told my sister that, but... Henry won't understand where I've gone, is the thing. He'll wait at the door all day for me. What's yours like? I'll keep an eye out for him. Pax isn't a... Peter stopped. What did it matter if Pax wasn't a human? Why should it matter if he wasn't a dog? He's red. Black legs. How big? Coyotes out here. They have pups this time of year. They'll take down a small dog when they have a litter to protect. He's pretty small. Peter shifted his weight off his blistered palms. Please, I've come a long way to do this. The soldier gazed at his photo another minute before slipping it back into his wallet. Then he looked back at Peter. He seemed older again. We're holding them, but they're coming. You can go in, but you've got to be back out by tomorrow. He pointed at Peter's crutches. 
Can you do that? I can. So you'll let me through? The soldier looked around and leaned in. This road is patrolled hourly, but we only guard the main trail entrances. No one is stationed in the woods yet. You travel 20 yards in, no one will stop you. But listen, if you get caught, I didn't say that. Now get out of here. Thanks. Peter turned and started for the woods before the soldier could change his mind. Kid, I hope you find him. It was quiet in the woods, but here the quiet was right, and it was broken by the sound of wild things, which seemed a promise. Here Peter could imagine Pax's red brush flicking between the trees. Here, when he called, it was easy to imagine an answering bark. These things raised his spirit so much that he could almost ignore the pain in his palms and his armpits, bleeding and raw. For an hour he pegged over ground that was so springing with decades of pine needles it seemed to lift him. Then he heard the rough growl of a jeep, and he ducked behind some brush until it passed. After that, he walked along the road's edge, sure that when another patrol went by, he'd have enough warning to take cover. And then he was there. It wasn't a landmark he recognized, or the way the road straightened out of its curve. It was the sense of betrayal that hung all around. He'd done something terrible here, and the place remembered. Pax, he'd called, not caring if anyone heard him. Let the jeeps come. Let the whole army come. He wasn't leaving without his fox. Pax! Against his shouts, the silence grew any deep, only deeper. Ominous now, not promising. He started along the road again calling and keeping his eyes to the gravel shoulder. He was sure Pax had had a toy soldier in his mouth when the car had peeled away. Whenever Pax had given it up, up on Peter, he would have dropped it. Peter wanted to hold it in his hand again, solid proof that his fox had been here. He walked a quarter mile, a half mile, eyes down, and then he stopped short. He wasn't going to find that toy soldier because Pax wouldn't have given up. Not ever. Pax would never have thought he'd been abandoned. They were inseparable. Pax had known it all along. Peter was the one who had to learn it. If Pax wasn't here, he must have gone home to find Peter, or tried. Maybe the river would have blocked him. Maybe not. Dogs made it home against crazy odds all the time. Pax was ten times smaller than any dog. So why wouldn't he have been able to find his way? Maybe he was there right now. Home. Home was about 10 miles southeast of the old mill, and the mill was probably four or five miles south of where he was right now. So he'd head south, calling for Pax all the way. The gorge beside the mill would be too dangerous to navigate in the dark, so he'd sleep there and then make the descent at dawn. He would cross the river where it widened out at the mill and then after another ten miles of trails, he knew he'd be home. Hold on, he said out loud. I'm coming. Thank you for joining me for this read aloud. We'll see you again. Bye-bye.